My name is Shalom Garowitz. I'm a professor of video art and new media at Ramapo College. I'm happy to introduce Liz Magic Laser. She is a multimedia artist whose work has interdisciplinary significance. She uses all the tools available to a contemporary artist, fusing performance, dance, narrative, and video to comment on communications, interpersonal relationships, and the responsibilities of citizenship during our fraught time. As you will see, her work is serious and whimsical at the same time. Her personal vision is amplified through the collaborative efforts of her team. Liz and my daughter Callie have been good friends since the 1990s when they attended high school together. I remember that of all of Callie's friends, Liz was the only one who always asked about my art making activities. She wanted to see the digital prints and the videos I was creating. I've observed the trajectory of Liz's career, including her successes at Wesleyan College and Columbia University, her discovery by some key art world insiders, and especially the evolution of her work from relatively modest and edgy to epic and profound. Please join me in a virtual and enthusiastic welcome to Liz Magic Laser. Thank you so much, Shalom. It's really a pleasure to be here after knowing you for so many years, and I'm excited to speak with your students. So um, I'm going to get started with doing a screen share and show you some images and videos and give you a little background. So I wanted to start with a, a little nod to my origins and background um, in honor of this being for Shalom, who I've known since I was a child. Um, so I grew up as well in an, uh, the household of artists. My mother's a dancer choreographer named Wendy Osserman. And um, I was a photographer. That's how I started out and really uh, defined myself as a non-performer uh, behind the camera. But in retrospect, this really um, informed my practice for many years to come because I confronted this issue of mediating the performance through the camera from a very early age um, as a young teenager and um, confronted this issue of the performance um, always, you know, being initiated or most often being initiated uh, by a camera made image you know, that the invitation like this one you're seeing now is often the, the entreaty to come to a performance. That's how you garner an audience. And um, so some of my mother's dancers became quite successful choreographers themselves, like Azure Barton here. So I would do um, all, all of their early press photography and photos for posters and postcards for the invitations. So um, this um, had me reckon with the, both the challenges of, of communicating live performance via the camera, but also um, seeing it as a very constitutive part of constructing a performance. And uh, I think it led to um, my desire to um, pose the camera as an active participant in the scenarios I was constructing. This was uh, the kind of uh, directorial photography I was doing when I first went into graduate school. And these are uh, my grandparents at the time. Um, this was probably in 2005, after a major hurricane had ripped up a tree stump. So, um, when I went into graduate school, I was very lucky because um, as I started to work with performance-based video, and that's a transition that happened very organically where the scenarios I was uh, constructing could no longer be captured in a single image. Um, but I was lucky because a, a theater director named James Dacre asked me to make video and still photographs with his actors to compose a set for a piece of his at Here Art Center. So um, I'd worked with dancers and 
they had been in my photographs and I had photographed their performances for some years, but I had never worked with actors. And this happened to coincide with me um, making my first scripted video and I tried to perform in it. It was a fraught relationship with an ATM machine that wouldn't give me what I wanted. And um, it's only, it was only four minutes long, but it took me hours to film because um, as I mentioned, I did not uh, train as much as a performer um, and really kind of rejected the role of the performer. And so I felt uh, doubly, this was reinforced by working with actors for the first time that um, I in fact still did not want to be the performer myself and um, really uh, resumed this directorial role. So I'm going to jump ahead a few years uh, to 2011. And that was, this is the first um, really large scale live performance I did for a performance art festival called Performa in 2011. And it was um, a live feed film that was uh, performed filmed and edited with an audience in a movie theater. So um, the audience became the extras and the backdrop and context really for the, uh, for the entire performance slash film. And um, the script was something that I adapted from uh, a number of interviews with American politicians. Uh, and I was looking at the time at, um, at the strange sort of lover's discourse character of the conversation between the journalist and politician. And I think that this was also um, somewhat sparked by having my first few shows and being asked to do interviews and feeling um, rather uneasy about uh, having to explain my work when I felt I had already gone to lengths to um, provide uh, writing, often, you know, uh, zines or other text material that was part of um, constituting the work. I was already providing kind of TMI. That's really uh, something that I veer towards generally. And, um, and so I felt a little resentful and, and uneasy about having to then um, critique and explain my work on top of that um, through, um, through a number of interviews. And so around that time, I saw um, an interview between uh, Glenn Beck and Sarah Palin, and it was supposedly the first time that they ever met. And Beck starts the interview by saying to her, Sarah, I want to read to you what I wrote about what I wrote about in my journal last night because it's about you. And this really struck me as um, a teenager from an 80s movie, uh, like say anything, um, saying, you know, I want to read to you from my diary about how much I think about you every night. And so at this, at that moment, I was um, also really looking at the dynamic between traditional theater and method acting, a la Stanislavski, the um, Russian playwright and theorist, you know, who uh, was, became the kind of origins of method, what we know as method acting and this idea of emotional memory that you, um, that in order to play a character on stage, you know, who's been recently widowed, you could think about the death of your dog and, you know, go back to the, the, um, the, the temperature and smells and try to hypnotize yourself back into the state you were in uh, when this happened in order to uh, um, then hypnotize the audience with your illusory performance of being um, this, you know, compelling character on stage. Um, and so, you know, that's been kind of codified as traditional theater and then been critiqued as by the avant-garde theater artists and theorists who came afterwards, like Bertolt Brecht and Meyerhold, the um, 
the Soviet uh, theater maker who, um, who actually was a disciple of Stanislavski, who uh, then turned against him slash updated his notions. And um, so that more, what I'm calling a more avant-garde reaction in the early 20th century was, um, was basically the, the inversion of this method idea that instead you strike the pose of, you know, stabbing someone and you will then, um, the, the external pose will then um, filter to, to the impulse and the emotion. Um, so, you know, it's really mild and you'll feel happier or, you know, this idea of power posing that's been used in the business world. Uh, in more recent years by, you know, people like Amy Cuddy, um, that, you know, if you raise your hands up in the air as if you just won the race, then you will feel like a winner. Um, anyhow, I, I was interested in how politicians at the time, 10 years ago, were really increasingly performing these emotional outbursts and ruptures on TV. Um, you know, it was this moment when John Boehner was known for being, you know, became quite infamous for blubbering and crying on TV all the time. And I had also a recognition that this felt like um, he was imitating a reality television show confessional. And so that's something I worked with in this piece as well, where um, I collected snippets from many different interviews, you know, with Obama and Boehner and Sarah Palin and Hillary Clinton, and um, that took on this emotional character um, and romantic dimension and created my own rom-com slash romantic drama um, based on this. And I announced both in intertitles and in exactly what interviews and what the context of those interviews um, had been um, that were being adapted in every scene. Uh, and I also had a kind of MC clown, Audrey Crabtree in the center as well as a disembodied voice that was taken from some historical research into living newspaper productions, which had been a form of Soviet street theater right after the revolution, the 1917 revolution. Uh, that was a major um, collaboration between journalists and theater schools and buskers, you know, street performers. And it was really with the mission of spreading the news to the masses who were largely illiterate at the time. And this idea also was imported to the Broadway stage as a WPA theater project uh, to keep Broadway workers at work during the depression. So that ended up informing the structure of, of my production and my script. So I think I'll show you a little clip from that. It's a feature length film, so it's just gonna show you, I'll show you a few snippets from that. Hey, can I read you what I wrote in my journal last night? It's about you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah? Yeah. Tomorrow, I meet her for the first time. I'm actually a little nervous, as she is one of the only people I can see that can lead us out of where we are. I don't know yet if she's strong enough, if she's well enough advised, or if she knows she can no longer trust anyone. I don't know if she can lead us and not lose her soul. Remember when Ed Muskie cried? Oh, yeah, in 72. Yeah, that journalist slandered his wife and he jumped on the soapbox to defend her honor. By attacking me, by attacking my wife, he's proved himself to be a gutless coward. And maybe I said all I should on it. It's fortunate for him he's not up on this platform beside me. A good woman. <laughs> Do you get the anger? 
I have the anger inside me. <laughs> a guy that's been in the gutter and spent a good deal of his life in the gutter should think twice about accusing me. Okay, fingers don't come any closer. Fuck him. Oh, that's it. Oh, Fuck him. him. Come on, guys. Hey, come on. Hey, hey, hey. Will you resign? Do you, Do you expect, expect to stay? stay? I came, came here, here to, to accept, accept the full responsibility for what, what I've done. done. The question that people, your constituents, and a lot of us have is, what, what were, were you thinking? thinking? I don't know what I was thinking. I don't think I was thinking. It, it wasn't, wasn't part, part of a plan. plan. Have you really apologized to the people? To all of you who were misled, to everyone, to, to all, all Americans, Americans, I am sorry. sorry. I apologize to you. Yeah, so the ending, I think, was ripping on you know, a number of different sources from Schwarzenegger to Anthony Weiner during his first scandal, I think, you know, shortly before the performance, he had a, uh, a press conference maybe a month or two before that I added in to my ending, um, my finale, where, um, you know, I, I was really drawing on these uh, apologies to, to the people out at large that often took on the character of a man from a Hollywood film apologizing to uh, his cheated on and scorned um, spouse. So, um, and here's just an image from that Soviet living newspaper that I mentioned, and as well as um, a Broadway living newspaper production that became a touchstone for me called Injunction Granted by Joseph Losey. And here was the promo pick, which I actually took at a real screening on 23rd Street in Manhattan of a contagion, strangely. Here's another image um, from some archival research I did um, on this injunction granted uh, production. You'll see they used a kind of tramp style clown and I had a more contemporary red nosed clown. So for I would say a good four years that followed, I was really focused on uh, the way that politicians were using and abusing the performing arts um, in order to sway the public and essentially wield power. And um, I was, I think, uh, some other projects I did focused on on body language, and I worked with um, Cunningham dancers. And then um, slowly, I was started to realize and pay attention to how um, these performing arts skills um, were being used across many, increasingly being used across many different professions. And as I received more and more TED Talks over, um, over the years uh, by email, and I would hear these offhand stories about a friend of a friend who was an MIT scientist who was, uh, you know, a, one at least one day a week for a year was rehearsing and prepping and developing his TED talk because so much um, of his funding was going to be affected by his performance. And this really uh, got me thinking about this, uh, the proliferation of, um, of how important this specific type of performance of self for the camera um, was becoming across so many different fields and um and, and you know also i was looking at how um again what i'm calling these performing arts skills and these hollywood media training techniques were being paired with market research and um, a lot of um, ideas from scientific management to um really maximize the efficiency of every gesture word and cadence again, for, you know, optimum effect and often optimum profit. So I started um, looking at these TED Talks through a more critical lens and, um, and thinking about working with that form of performance of self. And in part of what I found um, intriguing and insidious about 
TED Talks for in particular is that they, um, not always, but that they often seemed to promote an idea of self-interest as potentially virtuous, you know, that by being the best entrepreneur you possibly can be, you will end up saving the world and helping people, which is, you know, an idea that I'm skeptical of. So um, in going through a number of different ideas of what kind of, you know, script would have a productive um, dissonance and tension with this TED Talk form, I eventually arrived at um, Dostoevsky's uh, 19th century novella, Notes from the Underground, which is itself an attack on the idea of enlightened self-interest. In his, you know, in his case, it was the socialist, the proto-socialist ideal of enlightened self-interest, that if you pursue your individual greatness, you will um, uplift all of society. Um, and I thought, wow, this Ted is really the contemporary capitalist incarnation of this very um, ideology that Dostoevsky was attacking. And so I decided to work with a 10 year old uh, child actor named Alex Ammerman, because I really, I thought also that um, using the child as this um, figure of innocence and um, projection screen for the future um, was something I, I had become increasingly interested in and how, um, especially, you know, politicians and these business leaders uh, often, you know, use the child as a figure and as an excuse to, you know, vindicate what they're doing and often an excuse to um, limit the liberties of, uh, of others, of people who are othered in our culture by um, claiming this, you know, protection of the child and protection of, of the future for our children. So, and I ended up filming, um, I was looking for a properly Silicon Valley-esque um, small kind of theater to film this presentation in and found that Kickstarter had the perfect um, scenario for this. Um, wrote them a proposal to film at their small theater venue. Um, and I'll show you a little clip from that as well. People everywhere and at all times have preferred to act as they chose, even when it was contrary to their own interests. And sometimes they absolutely should. And that is my idea. One's own independent choice, however wild it may be, is that most advantageous advantage which we have overlooked. While I'm alive and have desires, I would rather my hand shrivel and fall off than overlook my independent choice. You believe in building a perfect world, a crystal palace that can never be destroyed. But I'm afraid of your ideal system because I'm not allowed to criticize it. I can't even stick my tongue out at it. And I don't say this because I love sticking my tongue out at things, but I resent systems that stop me from doing so. Go ahead, stick your tongue out at me. Come on, I'll do it back. So I had the I had a show in LA with the gallery I work with there called Various Small Fires uh, with this project and one other companion piece in early 2015. And this um, happened to coincide with a moment of um, I would say disillusionment I was having with the art world. And so um, I also came out with a book about my work at that time and 
who's doing a book signing at a book fair and has the kind of quintessential LA experience of a Hunger Games producer approaching me and saying, have you ever thought about making a movie? And um, I knew it was uh, still quite a long shot, uh, but I got excited and said, well, yes, but uh, really I have, a, I have a lot of reality television ideas. And um, so I, over the course of the next year on and off, I would workshop some reality TV show ideas with him. And it kind of loosened me up and got me out of my uh, disillusioned phase. phase um, because um, I knew that it was unlikely these reality shows would, would happen. And I think, you know, I came up with an elevator pitch at the time that was uh, actually something along the lines of uh, uh, the Apprentice meets The Daily Show in a crossfire debate for the YouTube generation. So it was a lot of citizen journalist kind of challenge shows. Um, one other thing that, that was a segue to the next project, but one thing I wanted to mention is um, the big coup of this project um, is that it, was, it had a few reviews and then Ted got in touch with me and said, we'd like to post the video on our blog and post our own review of it. And uh, so it's eternally set in stone on the TED blog, which I was also very excited about this prospect of um, disseminating the video through the very avenue I was critiquing. And I suppose it's um, also part of my history um, in photography and I also taught some photo art history and I have been, you know, influenced by the um, historical photo montage artists um, in Germany like uh, John Hartfield and um, Raoul Hausmann and Hannah Hawk uh, who took from the medium of, uh, of the magazine, of, you know, magazine photos and texts um, and re-collaged, uh, you know, disassembled it and reassembled it and put their work back out there through magazine avenues, through the same kind of broadcasting medium of the magazine that was, you know, for them, what, you know, inter internet video is for us now and social media. So, um, so yeah, I was very excited about that. So, um, although the reality television show um, in the, you know, mainstream with Hollywood producers never happened, um, it did um, take shape as uh, art projects. And so um, this next work, I was also um, riffing on a kind of therapy that I grew up hearing about um, that was quite popular in the 70s called primal screen therapy. You might have heard of it because John Lennon and Yoko Ono were famously um, really into it and put out recordings of themselves screaming in their um, cathartic uh, releases. Again, I became interested in it because it had all these unacknowledged um, relationships with method acting where you're um, really in this case, rather than the theater director having leading the actor to um, you know, hypnotize themselves back into this emotional memory and this traumatic state from childhood, for instance, in this case, um, it's the therapist directing the patient. Um, uh, and um, in this case, it's a treatment. And as well, a kind of through line that a, a consistent interest in my work has been the interview as a form. So I started with um, the uh, performance piece, which in the movie theater, which I don't know if I mentioned, was called I Feel Your Pain, a Clinton quote. And again, that was all adapted from um, political interviews. And, um, and then in this case, um, you know, that the political interview is for the uh, politician to broadcast their persona and try to, you know, use their performance to get a grip on power. And in the case of the therapist interview, it's a palliative treatment. And so, um, I thought, you know, what if we, you know, right at, by now, primal therapy, you know, has maybe been um, outmoded. It's thought of as, you know, 
this uh, 70s maybe a tangent of the new left and these kind of radical practices but I became increasingly um, curious about how so many of these um, radical countercultural practices from the 70s are now being used um, by um, corporate consulting firms. Also, you know, with this idea of uh, these practices will um, help people arrive at self-actualization and become, you know, happier and more at peace with themselves. And again, it's being sold by these firms in, in the name of profit that, you know, a happier, more actualized workforce um, is going to be a more profitable one. And after I um, started to speak with um, a few former primal therapists, um, many of them had become uh, executive coaches. So they were quite literally using these um, therapeutic strategies to, to help business people uh, become more convincing and powerful in their roles. So um, in this case, this happened in the lead up to the last election. So I filmed in the summer of 2016. And uh, I think I put a casting call out at the beginning of the summer because I wanted to compose a political primal therapy group and, and direct it in a la reality TV, you know, where I was going to manipulate, you know, with the people knowingly, um, the participants, you know, had to be willing to collaborate with me on this, but I was asking them to let me tamper with a very short kind of version of this therapeutic process um, in, in a way that was um, somewhat akin to how I imagine a reality television producer has, um, has their participants uh, develop inflammatory versions of themselves and learn to uh, perform a hyperbolic, conflictual version of themselves in order to, um, uh, for, for entertainment value, essentially. So, um, so I put a casting call out for true believers. So they were amateur actors who were true believers in um, Trump. This um, man here was pro-Trump, another was you know, a Trump hater. It was also the time uh, when um, the Brexit vote was happening. And so it was, I as well had um, someone who was pro and anti-Brexit in this group. There was both a kind of tongue in cheek dimension to doing this and a very earnest, and then as well the, simultaneously an, er an earnest um, experimentation in, you know, let's take the effective or affective uh, dimensions of this practice and, and see what it can do to foster an emotional um, political discourse that um, interweaves people's personal traumas with their political frustrations. So it was really guiding them to flip back and forth between con confronting those two things and um, confusing them in a lot of ways, both finding the analogies between the personal trauma and the political frustrations and um, commingling them. So I'll, I'll play you um, a little bit of it. I have an actor. I did find a someone who was practicing primal therapy named um, Valerie Bell. And she um, had been, it said in her bio that she had been an actor and singer when she was younger. So I thought, okay, she'll, she's gonna be open to this. And so we had a, a wonderful collaboration and have also um, conducted public workshops together using um, the uh, sort of perversion of her practice that I, that I, she was willing to develop with me. So I'll play you um, a little bit of that film. Oh yeah, here first is the, um, is one of the installations of this video. And you'll see there are also stuffed animals of political party logos, because in the primal therapy that often happens in a padded room and the client is asked to, towards the beginning of the therapeutic process to um, go out and get a stuffed animal to hug and to embrace and to beat, you know, to punch um, as part of um, the process of, um, of going through their trauma. And the idea with primal therapy, um, Arthur Janoff, who created it, 
Um, his idea was called abreaction, and it was a re-experiencing of the traumatic event in order to have a catharsis. So yeah, these are the logos I was riffing on and I was using um, for the first few times I showed it in England and France and Scotland. Um, I kept adding stuffed animals based on their political party logos. And in France, I had a show with this right in between the, the two rounds of their last presidential election. And we have workshops as well there. It's the Labour Party. Rose. So I'll play you a little bit of that. If this part of your body could make a sound, what would it be? Just... Ah! Uh! Uh! I think it'd probably sound like that. Ah! Uh! Like a toilet bowl going down the drain. That's how it sounds like. Disgusting thing sounds like that. Think about those people making decisions for us, who are hurting us. Bring them into the room with us now. David Cameron, Boris Johnson, and Nigel Farage. They're the ones that upset me the most. What do you need to say to them? You're ridiculous. You should have been there. You should have been up and you should have been taking care of me. If you really love me, you'd stop, stop trying to change me. They are doing and saying things you know are wrong and you don't have any control over it. Yeah, but this is what's going on in this country because you, 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 like you take Hillary and she's like sort of like the same way. She goes around, around the battle of, of, of the questions and stuff, you know? Like, and right, oh, right away, she'll, she'll divert the question and go, well, don't vote for Donald Trump. She knows how to be a leader. She knows how to manage an office. You're fake. That's all you are. You said something, you did the opposite. I hate you. I hate you. I believe in Donald Trump and where he wants to fix the immigration. I'm going out with this, um, this woman, but I think that she's pure in her heart. But motherfucker, boy, did I get fooled. Did I get fucking fooled. Oh my God. She fucking played me. She played me so bad. You hear me? A liar. A fucking liar. That's all you know. Lying. Tree. Trap. You need experience. Trap. 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 You fooled me. You deceived me. Trap. I trusted you. I trusted you because you were all I had. I feel trapped. All I had. Oh. Stay. 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 Or anyone else. You're about oh, yourself. Okay. You're gonna pay for that. Good. I know. You're gonna pay but for that. I know. I know. You know that. You have to pay for that. Tell and you will. Because right. I shouldn't oh, have to. Right. So, I, for about a year or two, I think I only showed this work in, in Europe, and I felt. Um, because he had made it before the election and did not expect him, Trump to win. Um, I think um, the whole project became more on the nose than I expected to here in this country. And I felt um, a bit uneasy about showing the work here. And I think it wasn't until two, out, two years after I made it that, um, that I started to have some shows um, in the US with this work. And, and do some, some political therapy workshops. Um, actually, I did one a few days before the last election with Valerie. We did it at, at BAM, and um, then it became this uh, haunting memory of how no one was angry at that time, two days before the last election. So, but I did, you know, have this, um, I think, um, early recognition of when his campaign 
his first campaign first gained traction and they began thinking about his brash impromptu style and you know as i was saying since much of my past work is focused on how drama techniques are used by politicians and business leaders to help them fine tune their behaviors and maximize um, the efficiency of their every gesture and word i think i recognized trump as as a different breed of performer, as um, someone who was really a product of reality TV and um, someone who was trained by reality television producers um, in improvisational performance methods rather than the rehearse, um, the fine tuned um, memorization of script and rehearsal type of performer. Yeah, I mean, I think he was really schooled in an inflammatory and, you know, controversial method of improvisation because when you look at interviews from him of him from the past um he seems arrogant but nowhere near who he became uh, from the reality television performance school uh experience um and i also then became interested um i suppose in the years that followed in how um both he and since i'd spent this time in france we had, with macron being elected but I, I started to think about how both Trump and Macron were being kind of self-styled and styled by their strategists as the child rather than the um, more typical um, paternalistic or parental figure that the politician usually um, assumes. And, you know, both by himself and by commentators, they were being, um, you know, I guess with Trump, he's someone who was being cast as someone who uh, throws tantrums, for instance, or, you know, bullies without restraint. Um, so this all kind of leads into the next project because, uh, so with the primal speech, primal therapy pro uh, project, I had a show with, as I mentioned in France, and then um, I started to, to talk to um, uh, curators at the Pompidou at the museum in Paris, um, they came to the show and said, you know, what would be a movement? They kind of initiated a conversation of what would be the movement based um, version of this political therapy. I guess that's what came out of our conversation because they were doing a, 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 a movement and dance based exhibition the following year. And so, you know, in thinking through these archetypes of, of parent and child, as I mentioned, um, I thought back to uh, a political science book from the 90s that was popular by um, a cognitive linguist named George Lakoff called um, Moral Politics, How, How Liberals and Conservatives Think. And he had this idea that um, really these differences between right and left in America come down to um, different family values. And he talks about that the liberal is um, subscribing to a nurturing parent ideology, whereas the conservative is subscribing to a, discipl a disciplinary parent ideology. And so in that case, it's really that, you know, that person believes that um, discipline is what is best for the children or for the citizen in that matter. So that, you know, someone, someone who's conservative even, um, if they are benefiting from social services, they will always vote for the person who will cut those ser social services because they don't, they believe so strongly that people should not be spoiled and that that is not what is good for the people or for the child. And um, on, the, on the other hand, um, the liberal will always vote for the politicians who um, were, are going to raise taxes, even if they try to wiggle out of it when April comes around or because <clears throat> they believe so strongly that um, having social services and nurturing support is what is best for people. So anyhow, the premise that I came to for um, this project at, at the Pompidou um, was actually uh, developing a kind of um, personality testing corporate consulting firm model that um, has become popular this was one of my um, guiding light reference points, kind of spirit animals for this, a firm called Insights Discovery, that, um, whose main client was Microsoft for many years. And um, 
again, um, rather than the, you know, radical therapy, in this case, it's more of like an I Ching or um, tarot card, um, astrological sign kind of new age practice of self-actualization um, is being, you know, rebranded and offered up to corporations for, um, um, in order to um, enlighten their workforce and make them, you know, more actualized and maximize profit. So um, with this firm, Insights Discovery, they have a very simple uh, four type personality testing system and it's color coded uh, and it, each um, personality type is defined by a motto or a mantra and which is um, seen on these uh, big Lego blocks, which all of the workers are then given to have on their desks and announce who they are to um, their coworkers so that um, everyone knows what kind of communicator you are. You know, so it's, you know, show me you care. I need to know you care in order to have a productive conversation. Um, is that first green type at the top? And then my favorite is the one at the bottom, the red one, be brief, be bright, be gone, which in my mind is really the asshole personality type. Um, but in this, um, you know, new age ethos, no one's an asshole. If you just um, embrace who you truly are, you can make it, you know, productive. If you acknowledge your communication uh, style, then um, you can actually, you know, avoid conflict and um, make communication faster and smoother in both your personal life and work life. Um, so again, um, my thought was to, in this simultaneously tongue-in-cheek and um, sincere enterprise, um, I, I thought, well, let's, if this has, you know, these kind of practices have um, an allure and maybe some redeemable dimensions that are perhaps productive to them, um, as well as some dubious, insidious ones, um, let's try offering this to the citizenry as a kind of workforce to be um, for, you know, their communication styles to be reformed for their discourse. So um, in this case, in, instead of the primal therapist, I found two different, very different types of movement therapists to work with. One who is based um, in anthropological research and another who was a body-mind centering practitioner. And um, I worked with those um, four archetypes I showed you in the graphic um, of the disciplinary parent, the nurturing parent, and I added to that the, my recognition of the new child types, and I had the um, rebellious child and the obedient child um, as part of my, what I thought of as my kind of political cosmology personality testing system. And so uh, in this case, my diagnostic test was actually a handshake, and we worked with a uh, with a bodywork practitioner um, who had her basis in, you know, osteopathy to, to find a way to uh, judge that handshake, which as well as a kind of nod to the type of businessman who judges someone on the firmness of their handshake, which, you know, Trump really represents that kind of stereotype. And he had recently, the year before, prior to this, um, had this um, famed, a prolonged handshake with Macron where neither of them would let go. They didn't want to be the first to let go. So uh, again, basically you walked into the lobby of the museum and were greeted by um, one of my personality tester movement therapists who would um, offer to shake your hand, which you know, outstretch their hand and um, try to prolong the handshake and lead you over to the side of the lobby where um, this foam stage was and uh, you could come on the stage and learn uh, your, you know, choreography that would help you actualize your type or you could sit and watch and learn by observation. But I, I wasn't surprised and happy in the end that probably 70% of people uh, really were willing to get on the, the stage and learn, learn the moves with, with um, my performers. And it was 
an exciting space for me to work in because um, the lobby is very casual. People are, you know, have their laptops and they're having a coffee and working and hanging out there. And it's a, a surprisingly unintimidating space. So I think people felt uninhibited and, and willing to get in on something like this. And um, something that happened, again, this often happens for me because I work so topically um, that in the lead up to the performance, um, the Cambridge Analytica scandal broke. And this also you know, revolved around a personality test offered on Facebook that then was used to target political propaganda. And so I felt, um, you know, this is uh, that um, this idea that was somewhat absurd to have the personality testing of your political type uh, became much less absurd right before the performance was being staged. And here was one of the um, emails internal emails linked by the times when the Cambridge Analytica scandal first broke and they were, it talks about, you know, testing for things as esoteric as violent occultism and black magic. So um, yeah, I needed, I felt that I wanted to um, update uh, or ha let this um, recent event inform how I staged this work in, in the somewhat public realm. And so I decided I would use the jumbotron behind in the museum lobby behind the performers to um, update the percentages of each type as the performance went on. And it's missing here, but usually it would say how many people had been um, assessed. And by the end, it was 404 people had been, uh, Pompidou visitors had been assessed. So I just skipped over um, the video version, which was installed in, in one of the rooms you can see below, over the fence below in this image. Um, but instead, maybe I'll show you a moment from just some performance documentation. Um, yeah, because there was a kind of training video version that you could see when the performance wasn't happening and follow along with. But uh, the performance did happen about five hours a day for three weeks back in 2018. And there's that jumbotron I mentioned. So here's a moment from the performance documentation. Thank <laughs> you. 
So um, moving on to the last and most recent project that I wanted to share with you, I made um, finally a more um, fully fledged reality show uh, um, based on an invitation from an art and technology nonprofit um, art space and film house and cultural center in Liverpool, UK. And um, Liverpool has a big history of uh, labor rights and labor unions. And um, they had initiated a um, year long project about the future of work. And they um, asked me to submit a proposal for, um, for the key kind of uh, commission project for this, um, this year of research that they were doing. And they sent me this very long uh, kind of prospectus of different categories of the future of work. And the eighth and final cat category was the gig economy. And this really sparked something for me because I have used these um, platforms um, that you might be familiar with called Fiverr and Upwork. And the one popular in the UK is called People Per Hour. I've used them over the years to do some transcriptions and audio mastering or get a kind of spoof logo made. And um, I'd even, I think the first thing I used it for was to try to get um, a child actor voiceover to see if it would work for, for a video I was making. And um, this really kind of showed the seams of these um, and the strangeness of these platforms where everyone is supposed to be anonymous. You're not supposed to speak by voice or video with anyone. And this is both to protect all the users, but primarily it's about protecting the profit of the platform who takes a big cut. And um, Fiverr I found um, particularly fascinating because it was really um, for create for it was really about um, offering creative professional services um, that were used by um, entrepreneurs and small businesses to um, have, you know, aesthetics that, you know, the, I feel like it's really about a kind of corporate aesthetic that broadcasts um, an enterprise that's larger than you really have. So the idea um, of Fiverr is it's, or how they market and brand themselves is that it's making um, entrepreneurship accessible to a wider array of people, it's you know, uh, making it, you know that kind, this kind of social mobility of the lap type, the laptop lifestyle um, increasingly accessible for more people. So, um, and then I was also interested because my work is very much based on a based in computer use for for a better or worse. I spent a lot of time in front of the computer, developing scripts and proposals and video editing and script writing. And so I also have a kind of kinship with this uh, laptop lifestyle. And um, so I proposed to um, make a reality show about um, these creative gig workers that would be made um, in collaboration with them. And my kind of uh, I was somewhat modeling it off of a, a queer eye idea of, you know, self-improvement, you know, both the personal internal makeover and the physical makeover that they do um, for people on that show. And in, so in this case, I thought, okay, what's the, what's the makeover or re revamping needed for the gig worker? And I arrived at, um, offering all of my um, contestants or participants a life coach, but not, but a life coach that was specifically um, oriented towards what's become known as biohacking. So um, she trained with the um, Bulletproof Human Potential Institute, which is um, Bulletproof is a kind of a masculine Silicon Valley-esque version of Goop. If you know, if you know Gwyneth Paltrow's uh, um, beauty and spiritual and, you know, again, this discourse of updating um, the human being. And um, so a lot of, you know, interests for me came up about um, tracking devices and this kind of quantifiable self, which really in my mind, you know, these, there are these fasting apps and 
sleep and sleep apps and you know all these different kinds of trackers that are about scientifically managing oneself and so this um, life coach uh, was someone who was well you know versed in all of this and could offer these kind of tech solutions for t for the tech problems of spending so much time um, uh, being you know chained to the computer or beholden to it and I became became fascinated um, as I got to know these gig workers with you know the kind of urgent dimension to what they're doing almost like they're um, you know specialist surgeons who are on call and so you know they this, this is Zahid here in Pakistan and he designs logos and does video editing um, with two of his friends um, and they um, he'll get an urgent um, request for a revision and so he told me the story about um, taking out his laptop on the back of his friend's mo motorcycle in order to do one of these revisions. Um, and so I asked him to restage this. Um, and this was a kind of moment um, in a very challenging process of making this show where I thought, okay, it's on, it's game time now. And um, I have this um, show about a very kind of boring lifestyle of being in front of your computer. Um, I can unearth this and and do it in a not totally boring fashion although i did kind of have to face facts that um i set myself up for a somewhat qu quixotic challenge of making a uh, dramatic uh documentary tv about a very um undr undramatic uh form of work in life but um, it's been very strange because I made it mostly via Zoom uh, um, last year. And so I spent a lot of time on Zoom last year and um, directing people to film themselves in different ways and doing screen recordings of my interviews with them and the meetings with the life coach and, and as well as psychic I set them up with. And then this um, somewhat isolated lifestyle that, that um, they all had became um, a reality for, for many more of us than had ever been before with the COVID crisis um, hitting this past March. Um, here's a magazine um, piece I did about the project where I asked um, Zahid to do the graphic design for the piece itself that explains the project as well. It was for a, a French art, art magazine called um, Officiel. And so you'll see some of the tech devices I assigned to each person. My favorite one, um, this is one padlock on the lower right, which I had this um, out of work TV script writer who was doing some ghost writing at the time on People Per Hour. Um, I had, he wanted to get back to working on his novel and he was having trouble doing that with the different time management um, techniques we were offering him. And so in the end, I gave him a padlock wristband, which administers an electric shock whenever he um, tries to click out of his um, Google Drive tab where he was trying to write his novel. Um, so here is, the, is a view of the first installation of this project at, at FACT, at the um, place in Liverpool I mentioned, which is called Foundation for Art and Creative Technology. You'll see it's a kind of binge watching scenario where um, I had, so there's one episode about each of the five gig workers and each episode has um, components um, that were made by each of the other gig workers. So, you know, there was a woman, um, um, Kiki Wong, who um, was a voice artist doing automated response systems. So, you know, press one for English and two for Cantonese and her, set, her voice um, she's able to achieve a kind of mechanical uh, type of voice effect. Um, so she, she did the voiceovers for all the episodes, for instance, and then Alabi, who's in Nigeria, he did the animations for all the episodes. And you'll see there are seating cushions um, based on their original coaching intake forms that were kind of open source um, generic life coaching thing called the Wheel of Life, where I asked them to assess their levels of satisfaction in the different areas of their life, you know, love, money, work, and so on. And so um, when, while one episode plays on um, the other 
for screens, um, you actually see a kind of screensaver of the other characters working endlessly at their laptops. So I had them all film themselves for, for an hour just working at their laptops. And so you also hear the subtle kind of atmosphere of everyone typing or their interruptions of a phone ringing or uh, a dog barking or a child's, uh, you know, coming in to the room. And this gives a somewhat, I've been told it gives a kind of uncanny feeling while you're watching it because you think that there are more people in the room with you than there are. Um, or you think, you know, the dog has just come in um, and you're just kind of immersed in these um, low level typing sounds from all the other speakers surrounding you while you watch one episode. So um, I'll just show you the intro and we'll, we'll end with this. I'll show you the beginning of one episode to give you the gist of that. And then we can um, go into some um, questions if you have any. People used to go to work, but now the workplace is anywhere with an internet connection. Freelancers hunt for work using online platforms, selling their skills and meeting the demands of clients around the clock. But there's always someone willing to do more, faster, for less. How do you win? You upgrade yourself. Meet five online gig workers from around the world who've rejected conventional nine to five jobs to pursue the freelance laptop lifestyle. With expert guidance from our biohacking life coach, Louise, and psychic advisor, Count Marco, these five reality stars go on a journey of self-improvement to optimize their minds and bodies for success. In fact, they've already been hired for their next big gig to produce the show you're about to see. I'm Cardi. I'm the scriptwriter for In Real Life. I am Alabi, and I'm the whiteboard admitter for In Real Life. Hi, I'm Zahid, and I'm the graphic designer for In Real Life. I'm Kiki. I'm the voiceover artist for In Real Life. My name's Nikki, and I'm the social media content writer for In Real Life. Zahid is a 23-year-old graphic designer based in Harunabad, a small city in South Punjab. Pakistan. He's a computer science student at the Virtual University of Pakistan. This is me, Zahid Iqbal. I'm a graphic designer and a video editor. I'm also studying at Virtual University of Pakistan, where we take class on computers. When he's not in class, he's freelancing with two of his classmates, working as a team. They call themselves the Lancers Inc. on Fiverr, where they fulfill hundreds of gigs a year. And we are heading towards our studio for now to complete the projects. So this is where we do work after university class. Oh, we just do all kind of graphic designing, video editing, video direction and post-production. We are working on multiple projects uh, which we have on Fiverr. Fiverr is an online platform where people anonymously buy and sell digital services at a starting rate of $5 per gig, keeping 20% of each gig sold. Fiverr deploys dashboard diagnostics to manage its workforce, using star ratings and statistics to reward or punish sellers. In this system, buyer is king and can refuse pay for any reason. I'm, I'm a financially stable person now. In May, I have earned $1,742.2 and my total earnings has been $5,206. I have clients all over the world, but I only have 16% word domination on my dashboard analytics. This is too low. I need 100%. Freelancing changed my life, totally changed my life. I had no laptop, no smartphone. 
So I just wanted to, to share that part um, and with that, that part where he has the dashboard analytics that show world domination, because this is really um, the kind of uh, sinister dimension, I think, of uh, what the sites are selling to their workers. You know, it's they have to market to their potential workers. That, and, you know, they're giving this, them um, this, you know, artificial sense of agency and power that they can feel like the CEO in their very own boardrooms, um, looking at the world map of where they're expanding their business to. Um, whereas, you know, in fact, um, they can be denied pay for any reason and, and often are. And there's very little recourse and there's no, um, if you're sick or have a death in the family, there's no one to appeal to. There's, you know, instead of a boss, you have an algorithm that has no, you know, empathy or understanding. You know, so I have a lot of uh, criticisms of uh, the proliferation of these platforms, which I really think um, basically mimic a kind of call center logic and proliferate it across all these um, different fields. And then by the same token, as I, I unexpectedly in doing the project also had to confront the fact that these platforms were, um, were sparking the um, growth of sort of creative professional fields in, in the developing world. And they were offering, you know, better incomes and lifestyles to a number of young people. Um, yeah, so I think I will end with that and stop the, sh the screen share. And thank you so much for having me. And I um, would love to hear if you have any questions. <laughs>